Hey everyone, this is Ben Norton. The U.S. military has officially withdrawn from Afghanistan, along with other NATO forces. After 20 years, the war is over. And this was a war that cost, according to the U.S. government itself, over $2 trillion. And a lot of people have been asking where that money went. Well, as I've pointed out in my streams, Estimates show that up to 90%, 80 to 90% of the over $2 trillion spent went to the military industrial complex, went into the pockets of private for-profit contractors of corporations that were profiting off of this war. But what's incredible is that that kind of corruption, which is just so common, it's so commonplace that it's not even seen as corruption. It's just seen as the capitalist system operating normally. This is how neoliberalism works. The U.S. government outsources everything. It pays contractors. It's efficient, in scare quotes. It's, it's great and efficient. All the economists say it's, it's the most efficient model in the world. Of course, they're taking a cut, too. I mean, it's just, it's incredible corruption going down to, to the very roots of, of what, what was happening in the war in Afghanistan and, every, and so many other parts of society. But I want to talk about this incredible report that just came out looking at the corruption specifically in the U.S. military. We are talking about cartoonish levels of corruption here. And this is interesting because, you know, when we talk about the military industrial complex, we frequently talk about the so-called Beltway Bandits, right? These are the, the, the major military contractors, the big corporations, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, the really big corporations that make the weapons and the aircraft and the other materials that the military uses. But there's, there's less discussion of the corruption in the military itself. And there is a new report looking at how the top generals, the U.S. military leaders who oversaw the war in Afghanistan, personally profited. So it's not even just the Beltway Bandits. It's the generals themselves. The rot of corruption in the U.S. military and in the U.S. government overall can be found at every single layer from the bottom going all the way up to the top generals. This is an interesting article that was published in all places in the Washington Post, which is a poster boy for corruption. It's owned by, of course, the richest person on earth, 100 billionaire Jeff Bezos. But this article is actually really good. And, and it, I mean, there's some stuff that's really dumb about it, which I'll go into and criticize. And some of the framing, of course, there's always going to be elements of propaganda. But it is actually a surprisingly honest account of the flagrant corruption we saw over the past 20 years in the war in Afghanistan, going up to the top elites, the upper echelon of the U.S. military. So this article is called Corporate Boards Consulting Speaking Fees how U.S. generals thrived after Afghanistan. Specifically, it's looking at this top U.S. general, Stanley McChrystal, saying how he exemplifies how ex-generals sell their battlefield experience in other arenas from corporations to the COVID-19 response. So this was published. Today is September 4th. It was just published today, and I'm going to go through some of the hilarious elements of this article, just showing it shows how insanely corrupt the U.S. government is. So it begins talking about Stanley McChrystal, who was a top general in Afghanistan. He cashed out, as so many top U.S. government officials do when they leave government. He wrote a book, and it's a management manual titled Team of Teams, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World, which, I mean, it shows how he's cashing in on his wartime leadership. Whatever. I mean, clearly the, the leadership didn't work out very well. But anyway, this Washington Post article continues and it says very explicitly that, quote, the generals who led the mission, including McChrystal, who sought and supervised the 2009 American troop surge, have thrived in the private sector since leaving the war. <laughs> That's the nice way of saying cashed in in corporations, making millions of dollars. And it continues, they have amassed influence within businesses, at universities, and in think tanks. In some cases, selling their experience in a conflict that killed an estimated 176,000 people 
the vast majority Afghans, I would add, cost the United States more than $2 trillion and concluded with the restoration of Taliban rule. So we're talking about millions of dollars made. This is, this should be called corruption. That's what it is. But it's just, you know, normal business in Washington, right? And then here it says, the eight generals who commanded American forces in Afghanistan between 2008 and 2018 have gone on to serve on more than 20 corporate boards, raking in millions of dollars. And then these, here are some of the examples. Retired General Joseph Dunford, who commanded U.S. forces in Afghanistan in 2013 and 2014, then went to join the board of Lockheed Martin, the Pentagon's biggest defense contractor. No conflict of interest here. Nothing to see. Then it wasn't just him. Retired General John R. Allen, who preceded him in Afghanistan, he is now the president of the Brookings Institution, which has received as much as $1.5 million over the last three years from Northrop Grumman, another massive defense giant, another beltway bandit, this corporate death profiteer. So the Brookings Institution, which is one of the main think tanks in Washington, constantly advocating for more and more war around the world, and which is funded by the very same arms industry and Western governments that wage those wars, it is now led by its president, General John R. Allen, who oversaw the war in Afghanistan. But wait, there's more. Then there's the corporate media's favorite so-called intellectual, David Petraeus, who also oversaw U.S. troops in Afghanistan and was director of the CIA. And Petraeus, who preceded Allen, and of course, the Washington Post points out that Petraeus later pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge for providing class classified materials to his mistress and biographer. Petraeus is a partner at KKR, a private equity firm and director of its global institute. So these are some of the generals. It mentions again that the eight generals who commanded U.S. forces in Afghanistan from 2008 to 2018 have gone in to serve on more than 20 corporate boards. But the really the peak example of this is McChrystal. Now, of course, they all defend this. And Petraeus said that, that firm, firms, quote, aggressively sought him. Why? Because of his military and CIA experience. And of course, he stood by why he did that. Now, I'll talk about the hilarious excuses that these generals give for justifying their corruption. But the, the most hilariously corrupt, flagrantly corrupt example of this is Stanley McChrystal. As the Washington Post says, he is the quote, runaway corporate leader, a board member or advisor for at least 10 companies since 2010. He also leverages his experience to secure lucrative consulting contracts on topics dis distant from his defense work, such as managing the coronavirus pandemic for state and local governments, which, by the way, he has no health experience, health expertise. This is just blatant corruption. It points out that he was actually dismissed after, in 2010, McChrystal was quoted disparaging then-Vice President Joe Biden. But he has made millions from corporations, governments, and universities commanding six-figure salaries for some of his board positions and high five-figure speaking fees. So don't forget this when the U.S. government, under both Republicans and Democrats, constantly tell you that it's too expensive. We can't have universal health care. We can't have free higher education. No, it would be too expensive because all of that money, of course, goes to these private contractors and there is a revolving door if you're a top government level official, not just in, in the military, but in the State Department, in really Congress and the Senate, if you're in any high government level government official, if you're in high, any high level government position in the government, then immediately you can just leave and cash in and go work for one of these corporations. And of course, a lot of these corporations, as we'll see, are contractors and they're taking tax money from the, the state but we can't spend that tax money on public education, on health care, on child care. Nope, n never, because it has to, this is how the system works and it's inevitable. 
It's, it's a law of nature. This is how capitalism works. So here we go. For a position on JetBlue's board between 2010 and 2019, McChrystal was paid a total of more than $1.3 million for sitting on a board. He probably barely did anything. He probably joined a call every now and then. He also made roughly the same amount, that, that is another $1 million, between 2011 and 2018, working on the board of Navistar International, a vehicle and engine manufacturer. One of its subsidiaries agreed this spring to pay $50 million to resolve claims that it defrauded the U.S. Marines more than a decade ago by inflating the prices of armored vehicles used in, Af in Afghanistan and Iraq. So here we have a top U.S. general cashing in, getting paid over a million dollars to sit on the board of this corporation that was accused of defrauding the U.S. military. <laughs> no conflict of interest there. So the Washington Post continues, corporations seek out ex-military officials because, this is hilarious, because they're thought to hew to ethical codes and conduct themselves well in crisis, said Megan Rainville, a specialist in corporate finance and governance in Missouri State University. You can see here I wrote law. Absurd. Yeah, that's why corporations want all of these military officials, because they conduct themselves well in crisis and they hew to ethical codes. <laughs> sure. Tell yourself that. No, it has nothing to do, of course, with the fact that these people have friends in government who can score these corporations' contracts with the, the Pentagon, which is the biggest contractor in the world. No, nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with textbook corruption. No, it's because they're ethical, obviously. They're so ethical, they make millions of dollars from these corrupt corporations. But there you go. I mean, this is the Washington Post, you know. Ironically, they're talking about his book, Team of Teams, an awful title, by the way. Team of Teams, the book written by McChrystal, draws from his experience helping large organizations function more like small teams, presents the pitch his consulting firm, McChrystal Group, makes to clients as disparate as ExxonMobil and public health agencies confronting COVID-19. So again, this top general... He cashed in. He created his own consulting firm, McChrystal Group, named after him. You know, very, very creative. And he's working for ExxonMobil, not just for these military contractors. He's working for not just the military that's destroying the world, but the, cor the fossil fuel corporations that are destroying the world through climate change. Insane. And his book also contains the lessons he delivers to students at Yale University, the retired general teaches a course called simply leadership. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. He, his class is just called leadership. It's absurd. Leadership. I want to teach you to be a leader. Now that the war's fails have been laid bare, the leadership capabilities of those who perpetuated it should be reevaluated. You can say that again said Daniel L. Davis, a retired army lieutenant colonel who served two tours in Afghanistan. Military strategies used in Afghanistan will not aid U.S. businesses or, or governments, he argued. Quote, for years, it's been payday for the generals, while the war itself has been a complete disaster, said Davis, who is now a senior fellow. Of course, he cashed in, too. He's at a think tank called Defense Priorities, which at the very least, it urges military restraint. At what point do we hold anyone accountable? He said, good question. Probably never, because every, le every level of the U.S. government and the military, including you yourself, dude, are profiting from this. But that's how the, that's, that's how the, that's how the dish is made. And, I mean, it, it's, it's also just really hilarious because he's saying that these strategies should not be used because it won't aid businesses or the government as if this isn't the entire business model of everything in the u.s it's all a big scheme it's all a big ponzi scheme it's all you work a few years and then you go out in the private sector and you make money and then the government outsources all of that and they know the people who run the corporations because they work with them in government two years before this is it's, it's exactly how it works
So skipping forward a bit, it points that McChrystal endorsed Biden, by the way. It's hilarious. It's, it points out that he allowed that the 20-year conflict, quote, has had a very disappointing outcome, but he insisted, quote, I don't think that means that necessarily many of the decisions made and the strategies pursued were wrong. I think in many cases they were the best strategy that could have been. Okay, yeah, best strategy for you and your friends because you made over $2 trillion profiting off of this war. So here it points out, this is so, it just, it gets more insane. This is hilarious. So in 2013, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, keep this in mind, this is a public university funded with tax dollars. The University of Nebraska wanted to invite him to speak as for its keynote address at their, quote, building the 22nd century conference. conference. Let's focus on the 21st century, will we? And his speaking fee for the conference was, at least the starting fee, was $62,500. Sorry, $62,500 to give a speech. That was, the, that was his standard speaking fee. But there was a hitch. Because of a board meeting in Chicago earlier that day, McChrystal required a private jet to go speak at the University of Nebraska. So the fee would have to be f higher, $80,000 to go give a speech for two hours at a public university. The university agreed ultimately paying $70,000 because he made do without the jet. <laughs> I'm sorry. And this is not seen as corruption. This is seen as like normal business. It's not corruption in Washington. So... It talks about how he earned plaudits for reforming the elite counterterrorism counter unit known as JSOC and then directed the Pentagon's joint staff. So, you know, this guy was at the upper echelon of the military. I should, I should point out that JSOC is notorious for committing war crimes and it's seen as this elite unit, but they just torture people and kill people and, and blow their heads open with canoes, they call it. I mean, absolutely horrible. So here the article continues. Despite the scandals he faced, he remained in the business world's favor because then-President Barack Obama decided to let him retire with four stars. So, I mean, Obama himself was fueling this corruption. And of course, Obama has been cashing in as well. Obama has, gets paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per speech in Wall Street, which he does regularly. And I should mention, by the way, that in addition to the millions of dollars that McChrystal makes from sitting on these corporate boards and the tens of thousands of dollars he makes every time he speaks, he also has an annual taxpayer-funded pension of at least $149,700. So every year, just his pension is $150K. He also, at Deutsche Bank, he has conducted leadership training leading to a seat on the board of Deutsche Bank's U.S. holding company. <laughs> and it quoted a, an anonymous Deutsche Bank spokesman, sorry, an, 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 sorry, rather, an anonymous Deutsche Bank senior executive who said, quote, senior, ex, senior management is much more likely to listen, listen to military commanders because they're cool and they've killed people. <laughs> Yeah, they're more like, okay, so the banks want to listen to them because they're cool and they've killed people. It has nothing to do with the fact that they understand how intergovernment working, how the intergovernment works. It has nothing to do with that. No, it's because they're cool and killed people rather than a McKinsey guy in a pinstripe suit. I mean, just keep telling yourself that. And here, here we go. This is the other military contractor that McChrystal sat on the board of, Navistar. In 2013, a whistleblower filed a complaint alleging the company had forged invoices and pricing, pricing information for materials sold to the US government. And McChrystal, who, sat, who joined on the board in 2011, he was on the board at the time of this corruption. He was on the finance committee and he earned $200,000 annually. Ultimately, the U.S. intervened, arguing in court that the fraudulent documents had duped the U.S. government and costed at least $1.28 billion. 
dollars. But no problem because look, outsourcing is efficient. That's what all of the neoliberal economists tell us. If you take a, a neoliberal economics 101 course in any university in the United States, they tell you that this is efficiency. No, I mean, of course, the U.S. government lost $1.28 billion just from this company. But no, that, that's efficiency. You don't understand. This is how it works. And then it goes on. And then this is honestly probably one of the most insane parts of this article. It talks about how as coronavirus, coronavirus cases surged in Virginia earlier this year, state officials went shopping for books. The health department in Virginia ordered 53 copies of McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, for a total cost of more than 1,000 tax dollars. The supplier was, drumroll, McChrystal Group, the boutique consulting firm founded by the retired general back in 2011. So, so he was hired. This former general was, who has, has been linked to these many cases of corruption was hired by the health department. Again, this guy has no health background in Virginia to deal with its COVID response. We understand we have to, and when people ask why the COVID response was so awful in the U S and is now verging on 700,000 deaths. And his response was, order 53 copies of my book. That's how you're going to be able to deal with COVID. Insane. The firm built on the idea that McChrystal and his colleagues, quote, could capture the lessons they learned in counterterrorism and translate them into the private sector, has advised clients, including Bank of America, the National Basketball Association, Monsanto, and MedStar Health. These are the companies that this top U.S. general, this four-star general, is advising and making money on. Monsanto, one of the most evil corporations in the world. Bank of America and the NBA. And then two years ago, it, it, it expanded its work. It branched out from just the private sector. And now McChrystal, his firm, is advising the Department of Homeland Security's cyber unit and the U.S. Secret Service, with le and it's giving them leadership training. And then in 2020, his firm began advising state and local governments on COVID response. What? He has no health background. And it, he, it was one of the many consulting companies that secured no bid contracts to fill gaps in public health agencies. No bid contracts. But wait, no, that's... If you listen to, to all the neoliberal capitalist economists and, and every major university in the U.S., they'll tell you that this is, this is efficiency. You just don't like efficiency. So here it continues. A Virginia health, health spokeswoman said McChrystal's books were purchased for the department's work on, quote, culture change dynamics. <laughs> yeah, that's what you need culture change and not actual health policies to help people not die as over 600,000 of your countrymen have died. All told, McChrystal Group billed the state more than $5.7 million in 20 months. <laughs> Insane. McChrystal Group also consulted on pandemic response for the city of Boston and the state of Missouri for fees of more than $1.1 million and $2.2 million, respectively. So between Boston, Missouri, and Virginia, the firm may, has made around $9 million on COVID response. And again, McChrystal has no health background. He was a general. He doesn't know anything about public health. In those cases, hardly any of the consultants identified in the contracts had public health experience. So they're just hiring a bunch of generals being like, hey, they're good at shooting and killing people. Maybe they can help us deal with this deadly virus. So we're going to pay them millions of dollars of tax, tax dollars. Insane. McChrystal admitted, quote, we weren't experts in public health but we're good at getting networks to communicate and come out with the right answer and implement. Insane. This is the neoliberal outlook. We are leaders with a capital L. We know how to kill people. We know how to run a military. We know how to run an empire. We don't know anything about public health, whatever, but just hire us. Pay us millions of dollars. 
We wonder why the U.S. COVID response has been so awful. And then, this is insane. The director of Boston Planning and Development Agency said that McChrystal Group consultants served as the, quote, nerve center of our response. They led call, they did, every day they led an 8 a.m. call and then managed tasks arising from the conversation. Quote, McChrystal Group was the enforcer all day for the Boston Planning and Development Agency. So, again, I want to stress this point. The local governments were spending millions of dollars to hire a former general who knew nothing about public health to oversee their planning and development agency, their emergency response to COVID. He said that McChrystal Group would, quote, review and advise all city plans. This is insane. The U.S. government is a total failed state run by a bunch of Ponzi scheme firms that make all this money giving so-called advice and consultants, consultant ad, uh, consultancy that they have no expertise in. The fees in Missouri were $250,000 per month. They struck a former senior state official as too high for a small number of consultants. The consultants also interfered with the ordinary chain of command, causing more disruptions than upgrades. Many of the firm's recruits came from Yale, where McChrystal has taught since 2010. He said, quote, you fish in the pond, you're standing around. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying because he hired a bunch of students he liked in his class called, quote, leadership. And, and it, it points out that student evaluations in his class boasted that it was useful, quote, if you have any aspirations to climb a corporate ladder. That, that, that says everything. That's what it's all about. That's what everything in U.S. society, this failed neoliberal failed state, this failed regime that can't provide health care, that can't provide education, that can't protect its own citizens from floods, from floods on the East Coast and fires that are burning down California every year on the West Coast. It can't do anything, but it can make trillions of dollars in wars and siphon all that money to the private sector to all these corrupt generals. And hilariously, they conclude the article saying that McChrystal, you know, it's only natural that McChrystal takes on corporate work. He has to feed his family. Oh yeah, he has to feed his family with millions of dollars. Yeah, that, that's, putting, that's putting, as George Bush said, that's putting the family on the bread on the table. No, it's absurd. This guy is a peak example of the corruption at the heart, the rot of the U.S. government. And this leads me to another article I wanted to briefly talk about here, which is hilarious, which is from foreign policy here. The voice of the elite foreign policy bipartisan consensus in Washington. And even they are now acknowledging likewise that, quote, that the Afghanistan war was, quote, a Ponzi scheme sold to the American public. When a scam falls apart, it collapses fast. That is right. You can say that again. Yes, it was a Ponzi scheme. And, of course, who made the money on that Ponzi scheme? The military-industrial complex. The five military contractors. Here, I, I've quoted this in my live streams. Five military contractors got $2 trillion during the Afghanistan war. This is from the researcher Stephen Semler. And here you can see... Congress gave $2 trillion to five weapons companies during the Afghanistan war. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman. These are the real constituency in Washington. It's not citizens. Votes don't matter. No one cares about your votes. These are the real constituents. Wall Street, banks, Silicon Valley, and these Beltway bandits who made $2 trillion in the last 20 years. Well, Americans get poorer and poorer. Well, inequality increases. Well, California is on fire. New York is underwater. And while no one has education and health care anymore. Well, if you want education, you can get it, but you have to be hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So meanwhile, trillions of dollars are siphoned into the military industrial complex. And hundreds of thousands of Afghans died, of course, 
and a million Iraqis died. So anyway, here's this foreign policy story. It says a lot. It says, to understand the U.S. exit from Afghanistan, think of Bernie Madoff. <laughs> it is helpful to see the U.S. built Afghan state as a Ponzi scheme. It was all a house of cards, and at some level, everyone knew it. Certainly anyone who is familiar with the U.S. government's own Inspector General reports over the past 10 years would know. And yeah, I've talked about those in my stream. SIGAR, S-I-G-A-R, did, did constant reports on the insane corruption in Afghanistan in the U.S. puppet regime. And as I talked about in a stream I did, a podcast and a stream about the U.S. puppet president, Ashraf Ghani, who was a neoliberal Chicago boy, the Afghan Milton Friedman, the Afghan Pinochet, who privatized everything, who wrote an insane book in 2008 called Fixing Failed States. And then he oversaw his own failed state, comically. And in his book, Fixing Failed States, he used the word market over 200 times, this cartoonish neoliberal. He was the poster boy, cultivated in elite U.S. universities, trained at the World Bank, who helped implement those same neoliberal shock therapy policies in the former Soviet Union, in post-Soviet Russia. And then the U.S. helped install him in power through a rigged stolen election, through mass electoral fraud in 2014. John Kerry, U.S. Secretary of State, helped him broker a power-sharing agreement with his rival, Abdullah Abdullah, in which Abdullah was, I kid you not, named CEO of Afghanistan. And meanwhile, all of these military contractors and the top generals, as we just saw our bud, Stanley McChrystal, McChrystal, were making bank, raking in millions and millions of dollars. Well, the generals were raking in millions. The corporations were raking in trillions. So here we go. The definition from the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, the definition they use of, of a Ponzi scheme, quote, can easily be applied to Afghanistan. Now, this is, this is Foreign Policy, the elite magazine. So, of course, they're always going to have excuses to justify US, the U.S. empire's failures because they all agree the U.S. empire is good. They just disagree on how to run the empire. This article blames it all on Pakistan. And certainly Pakistan played a role in supporting the Taliban, but it was really the U.S. that bears responsibility, not, not Pakistan. But continuing here, there's some, there's some funny quotes in this article. Quote, Investors were told fantastical things by the Bush administration about how it had devised an entirely new approach to a terrible scourge and how it would eliminate evil. These promises were framed in terms of American exceptionalism, the mystique of special operations, the uncanny accuracy of armed drones that only killed thousands of civilians, I would add, and the mysteries of counterinsurgency warfare decoded and applied by uniformed wizards, exactly, who profited from this war handsomely. I mean, but that's actually a good, it's a good passage. It points out that all these technocrats insisted that Washington, they had mastered the art of imperial war with the tactics of special operations and drones and counterinsurgency sold to us by a bunch of armed in arms industry funded think tanks in Washington like the Atlantic Council, Brookings Institution, and a bunch of consultant firms run by, founded by, owned by these generals who retired like McChrystal, like Petraeus and the others. And there's, here's a hilarious example of this outlook, this the the just the neoliberal neocolonial outlook of these imperial overlords who thought that they could just create their own puppet regime in their image in Afghanistan. In 2001, Bush's deputy secretary of state exemplified this mumbo jumbo in comments he made to Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI, their spy agency. And again, this is Bush's deputy secretary of state the ISI head tried to explain what, what the history of Afghanistan was, and he said, quote, no, the history begins today. Year zero, the, the U.S., the new regime that created by the U.S. was the beginning of history. It's Francis Fukuyama all over again. I mean, this is how these elites think. This is really how these imperial overlords think. And so here is talking more about the Ponzi scheme of the U.S.-created puppet regime. 
None of the con artist claims are true. Investors are at first paid by persuading still others to invest. Thus, the U.S. Congress continually allocated funds while the administration gathered promises of support from other countries, never questioning the viability of the project. Kick the can down the road was the equivalent of the imperative of attracting new investors in a Ponzi scheme. In this case, the grifters were a series of U.S. presidents. And those U.S. presidents, and by the way, I should mention, it wasn't just George Bush. This article was clearly written by Democrats who were trying to blame Bush, but it was every president since Bush, including Trump, by the way, for all the Trumpists trying to have Trump, trying to get Trump off, even though Trump admitted he was like, oh, he realized he was so dumb that he finally realized that Afghanistan had over a trillion dollars in minerals. And he was like, oh, sweet. Now we should actually stay. I don't want to leave anymore. We should stay and steal all their minerals. But anyway, the grifters were the U.S. presidents who used these new funds to pay the original investors, all of it going back to the military industrial complex, of course. And their friends who work for the Beltway Bandits, were there, they're going to work when they retire in a few years. The Afghan puppet government continued to be financed, contractors got paid, ghost armies were invoiced, and real soldiers sent to their deaths. And by the way, over 200,000 Afghans were killed, which is never mentioned in these art articles by these elites because they don't care about the cannon fodder of the Afghans killed in their colonial occupation. The more funding to be found, the longer it could go on. Once a major investor withdraws, or, or is seen to do so, behold the rush for the doors. The Biden administration had to get it underway. Even Trump's deal with the Taliban in Qatar wasn't enough to pop the bubble. Yeah, because Trump realized that he could make money off of it too. And he just admitted like he did with Syria. He said he wanted to withdraw the troops illegally occupying Syria. And then he realized that Syria had oil reserves that he could steal. And he was like, sweet, we're going to stay in Syria to steal the oil and to starve the central government in Damascus of that oil revenue so it can't rebuild. So, and then there's hilarious examples of the corruption. The metrics compiled by the U.S. state and defense departments were classified in 2017 to keep the inspector general's analysts from looking at them because they knew it was all house of cards and because the state department and, de and defense department were making tons of money on this. And a lot of those government officials, when they resign, rather, sorry, when they retire, they're going to go work for those corporations. It's a loop. They have a vested interest. They're making money off of it. This is capitalism. It's how it works. Once it became clear that the United States was indeed serious about leaving, it all fell apart rapidly, just as in a bank run. As with a bank run, only if a big investor can surreptitiously pull out their money with, will others not notice their departure, wake up, and rush for the door. In Afghanistan, the big investor was the United States. Yeah, it was the United States, and but it wasn't necessarily the United States equally that that burden was not spent was not, you know, equally shared across the population. That was a 2 trillion dollar massive wealth transfer from taxpayers to the Beltway Bandits, to the military industrial complex and not just the corporate ghouls who work in these death profiteers, but also their friends in Washington, in these think tanks that they fund, and in the Pentagon and other parts of the government, the people who retire and get their fat pensions and then go work as corporate consultants like Stanley McChrystal. So with that said, I just want to point out $2 trillion over the 20 years of the war in Afghanistan went to these five companies, Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman. That is who profited. And in my streams here, we talked about the geopolitics of the war in Afghanistan. We talked about why the U.S. was so desperate to prevent China from having access to Afghanistan for its, its Belt and Road Initiative. The U.S. built this big puppet regime right in the middle of the new Silk Road that Beijing is trying to build. And for 20 years, Washington was able to help contain the rise of China, help prevent Eurasia from being further unified. And now, as I'm gonna talk about another stream, and now the Taliban-led government in Afghanistan has made it clear 
that China is going to be their key ally. They're going to incorporate Afghanistan into the Belt and Road. And hey, cool, maybe China will actually build functioning infrastructure and help develop the country, which the U.S. has been, totally failed to do in the past 20 years. And why? Because it never wanted to. Because capitalism isn't interested in development. It's interested in de-development. It's interested in exploitation. It's the same reason why 200 years nearly of British colonialism in, in South Asia, modern day India, including parts of Afghanistan. It's the same reason why those 200 years did not lead to South Asia being developed. It actually led to South Asia being developed. Sorry, being un underdeveloped, de-developed. That's what happened. It was underdeveloped and poverty increased and illiteracy increased and horrible conditions and malnutrition and all of these health problems increased all of that sorry it all increased poverty and, and and privation and immiseration increased in the 200 years under the british empire which extracted over 40 trillion dollars from south asia from the indian subcontinent it's the same thing the u.s did it profited from this war and the afghan people suffered the people in the region at large suffered including Iran, which, of course, was another target of the United States, which faced a massive refugee crisis. And now we hear all these complaints about Afghan refugees coming to the West, to the U.S. and Europe. Well, what about the Afghan refugees who went to Iran, who went to Pakistan and other countries in the region? We never heard about them because the West didn't care about them because they were making money off of this war. So, yeah, there were geopolitical considerations, absolutely. But the U.S. is also a capitalist system. And at the end of the day, it's also about making money. And as I showed in this stream, McChrystal, other top government officials, so many people have made a killing in the war in Afghanistan as they literally killed over 200,000 Afghans. They made a killing off of literal killing. At the end of the day, that's what the U.S. empire is all about. Thank you for watching or listening to Propaganda today. I'm going to do more streams and talks like this in the future. And you can find all of my streams and podcasts over at Rockfin. That is R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash Benjamin Norton. This was Propaganda Today. See you next time. <laughs>